the Grey Hat Beard podcast. Hello and welcome to Grey Hat Beard Show 49. We are the Modern Workplace podcast where we talk about all things Microsoft 365. I'm the Grey of Grey Hat Beard. My name's Kevin McDonnell. I'm the head of practice for Modern Workplace at CPS and an office apps and services MVP. My name's Al Erdley. I'm the hat. Uh, you can tell by the hat. Uh, and I'm the technical architect at a Microsoft Technology Centre in the UK. Hi everyone, my name is Gary Trinder. I am uh, the beard of Grey Hat Beard. I'm a, a modern work consultant uh, working for uh, Microsoft in the UK. I'm also a member of the PMP team and maintaining a CLI for Microsoft 365. Quite literally wearing the t-shirt today, which is... Uh, literally, yeah, brand new. Which is very good. Al, are we, are we allowed to talk about the hat today, Al? Because I, for people listening, could you describe your awesome hat? Uh, it is a new model army beanie. So it is from a gig that I went to just before Christmas, which was supposed to celebrate the band being around for 40 years, but it turned out to be celebrating 42 years because <laughs> it was delayed <laughs> by a little, <laughs> a, li- a little experience that we're all still going through. Yeah, um, that is I, that's a very cool hat. And I, when you mentioned the gig, it's got me listening to a lot more new model army at the moment as well. So, uh, oh, it's, it's brilliant stuff. Great gig. Well, if you never listen to them, go have a listen. Cool. So we, we're we going to try for this year. We, we're making a few little changes to Grey Hat Beard. They're going to seep out uh, a little bit over January and February. Well, actually looking at date more into February now. Um, just to tweak things down. And we want to try and reduce the amount of news and increase the amount of chat uh, that goes within there. So we've got part two. We we had a fantastic conversation with the Microsoft Spotlight podcast um, talking about women in tech. Uh, sadly, Al couldn't be there, um, but the five of us had a really good uh, chat about that. So do listen out for that next week and uh, hear about the conversation. I'd, I'd love to say what we talked about, but it kind of went all over the place. So uh, I can't entirely remember. Member. So you'll just have to tune in next week to uh, find out. But it's really interesting chat and really, really got me thinking about things as well. So that was that was great. But um, we're going to kick off with this one and talk about the news. And so our plan is each of us to pick a bit of news that we're going to chat about. Um, Al, do you want to go first? So I want to talk about Syntex Content Assembly. Um, and I don't know, I, it makes me feel old when I think about how long I've been looking for products that do this over the years. <laughs> so content assembly is basically the ability to use metadata, metadata to determine what information you want to bring together to generate a document. Um, it's a phenomenal capability. Um, the number of times I've worked with CRM systems where you want to build a contract or something, and you're basically saying, well, I know that I've got my standard terms and conditions, so how do I get those in and maybe tailor them a little bit based on particular characteristics of that contract? And that's that's really what this service is going to be able to do. Um, and it's something that there have been a lot of third party products out there doing this. Mm. Um, it has been a massive um, demand whenever you have consistent use of content. And you don't want to use a, a template that's going to change it. You want to use the metadata that describes that contract to actually define what the right content is that's going to go in there. So I can't wait to actually have a play with this and see whether it actually lives up to my probably quite high expectations, considering <laughs> uh, how many products I've actually tested that do this to a greater or lesser extent. Um, but it could be a, a game changer for, for a lot of organizations. And, and being syntax, I'm really intrigued because I, I haven't really seen it talk about AI being part of that that much, but I'm, I'm assuming it must be. Certainly the search and it talks about that metadata search within there. You, you assume there's going to be some, I was going to say some logic, but some magic, uh, I think, behind that. It's about finding the right content uh, as well. So to make it easy and effective, you know, it's really the, the nirvana you're aiming for there. Yeah, and I think that's it, isn't it? It's finding the right content to drop in. Um, And all the other services, you know, as you say, they've not had that AI element. They've been very strict rules-based solutions. So it would be really interesting to see what Syntex brings to the table in this space to actually make Mm. this easy. And, you know, if you don't have to manage lots of rules and or pick that information up more effectively, that could be really powerful. 
And it would be also interesting because it, it's funny you think of contracts first. To to me, that's one of the riskiest ones because if something goes wrong there, you could have a massive, massive problem. But then again, the benefit of being able to make sure you have the latest clauses. So if, if someone's got a, that shared clause to make sure that, that contracts end up with that latest one. But then I guess if a, con, if a clause changes, do you, uh, I suppose you can't enforce that updating on existing contracts. So managing that life cycle is going to be... I think that, as well. that life cycle around the snippets of information that you put in, you know, do I change a clause because the contract has not not been signed yet, but mm. the terms and conditions, well, actually, you, you've got a whole load of sort of process around that that you need to bring in. And I think that might be where some of the AI elements will come into it. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's a very intriguing place to put it in syntax. As opposed, because it doesn't really fit with what Syntex has been doing up till now. So it will be interesting think, to see how it works. But I think also it, it's it's not just contracts. If you think about any any documents where you have kind of snippets and you have reusable contents, you know, your requirements yep. documents, you can have those common blocks that you can use that I, I, I know, certainly in my experience, often get rewritten time and time again. And people have their own versions and they'll copy and paste from that one that worked last time. And then someone else will have this other preference. Trying to get a little bit of standardization there would be really nice. Things like, you know, working in consultancy, you know, when you're filling in mm. a, a tender, you know, oh, I've got all these standard questions, but they're all worded slightly differently. Can I find the yeah. right text to fill them in? That could be an incredibly time saving capability as well. I don't yeah. know whether it's going to do that, but <laughs> that could be really <laughs> powerful. I, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking of certain people who are still going to rewrite it in their own little style anyway. Oh, uh, I, I, I think I, magic and yeah, uh, I think we're thinking about the same people there, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, I think it's, and and the other thing I love about this is I, I kind of felt that Syntex had that big bang, that excitement about it, and then reality was people couldn't really find the the benefit that could justify that license cost. I think if it'd been included, people would have used it a lot, but uh, you know that ability to kind of extract metadata automatically uh, at the cost of was it three pounds per user per month for anyone who could see that metadata is is huge and it's not just anyone who did see that it's who could see it so you ended up having to license quite large groups of people potentially so you kind of had fairly small areas where it's of use the other news that came alongside this was also the the licensing model changed. So now you only need to license those people who apply those models and, and run them. If you want to see that metadata metadata and make use of that, then you can you can do that as a standard. And I I I'm just so happy. Uh, I uh, I have to admit I told a couple of clients because I couldn't believe that you had to license everyone. I was like, no no no, it's only the people that create it. And it was only when I sort of dug into the details and saw that it was like, oh. Oh, it really is that. Wow, that's that's amazing. Um, so I, I think this is a really sensible move, and I think uh, I, I'm hoping that these two things together will give a bit of love to to Syntex. It felt like it's kind of died off a little bit in terms of attention. Um, and and, but you've got to, I mean, and you've got to remember that you know both of those capabilities have had those third party solutions for many many years, trying yeah. to fill the gap. There is a definite requirement, and it is. It does tend to sit with a focus group who are managing the knowledge, doesn't it? So that change in licensing will really complement the, hopefully complement the adoption of it. Mm, absolutely. And I think the other one I mentioned was uh, for our multilingual friends out there, um, run form processing models against structured documents in French, German, Italian and Spanish. Uh, that's all coming in January uh, as well. So uh, I, I know that's been a common thing through quite a few other things about making sure that they multilingual always seems to be a kind of later thing um that comes on there so it's good to see that that get launched as well but yeah yeah definitely interested and i'm trying to see i don't think there's been a date for the content life cycle to be released has there it's kind of coming uh, soon yeah i don't think there's a, a date for for ga i think it's in preview at the moment isn't it yeah, so ho hopefully fairly soon on that one should be um, yeah great to see and some I could see London Stock Exchange using it in Northumbrian Water. So some uh, we'll put the links in the show notes, but two custom stories which are, I know always go down well. People like a bit of real life thrown in there as well, help categorising your your water quality, obviously. 
I was about to say that all those times that the sewage has been leaked, but that that would be unfair. I would say that that is more southern water. Uh, in my local <laughs> area. It's a particular bugbear for me at the moment. So uh, anyway, moving on before the uh, lawyers come along. Um, Gary, what was your bit of news, if you can remember? Yeah, so um, Microsoft 365 DSC uh, looks like it's had a bit of a, a, a rebrand, a refresh. Uh, certainly the docs have uh, had a bit of, uh, um, you know, a bit of sprinkles put over them. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what, new homepage. For those who don't know, what what is DSC? Yeah, so um, I guess first point out, it's an open source project. Um, it's a tool for uh, effectively uh, running a tool against your Office 365 tenant and extracting all of the configuration out of that that tenant. So if you ever kind of think, you know, what what's enabled, what's turned off, you know, all, all those kind of good things across the different services. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a good way to just kind of run um, the, the tool against your, your tenant and, and kind of bring that information out. The other side of that, DSC part of it, uh, so, so DSC being desired state configuration is a term that's been around for a while. It's um, certainly in PowerShell uh, kind of uh, areas is this idea of this desired state, right? So once you've got your configuration, you want to, uh, to make sure that that state stays as it is. So, you know, if people are going and making changes left, right and center, your configuration is drifting. You don't really know what the what the state is. DSC gives you that ability to take a snapshot and then monitor it um, and whilst you're monitoring make decisions so you could fire out alerts and go something's changed and then react to it or be a bit more kind of uh, um, rules based and just switch it back um, and, and keep that that state together but from a it's almost like from a point like source control isn't it around some of your settings in some ways Kind of, yeah. I mean, when you think about Office 365, sorry, Microsoft 365 and all the different services and all the different configurations within the individual services, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling, right, when you go into just some uh, of the areas, um, to have that that view um, across your your tenant um, and then being able to make sure that, that things are being being tracked and if you want to repeat this as well right you've got another tenant you want to replicate your tenant settings mm. in maybe a, a dev environment or a test environment you want to get as close to that production uh, environment and configurations as 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 possible so you get in you know uh, real world scenarios in those those the tenants is then something like um microsoft 365 dsc allows you to apply those configuration settings as well um so again no, i think the same from different reverse, We've been using it recently for the sort of security and compliance setting, setting up all your rules in a dev environment, testing it there, going, yes, this is what we want, testing yeah. that deployment in a test tenant, looking at there mm -hmm. and then applying that to live as well. So, you know, it, as you say, both ways can can really help track it. Yeah, exactly. It, it's it, you can go go both ways. You know, if you're in your development tenants or whatever, and you you want to turn on a com particular configuration setting, you, you've got your configuration in in, in code, right? It, it's generating these these um, these files that that um, have your configuration in them. You could definitely store that in source control, and then you know apply that so think of it as almost like infrastructure as code right for uh, yeah. for for 365 and um, we're not dealing with the low level server elements like disk settings and all those kind of things but it, it's a similar concept but just wrapped around cloud services or managed services um that would that we uh now uh, look after and operate so uh, so yeah it's been been good it's it's a project that's been around for for a few years now definitely um it's maturing um it, it, it's got some uh, you know good people behind it as well um and yeah it's great to see it so um, uh, yeah. i think the the, the other Both thing and, and we were debating before the show uh, as to whether this is new or they're kind of re-promoting it but you, you talked about that kind of comparing with a, a kind of no good standard so see how things have drifted mm -hmm. It seems what they're also talking about is trying to have some kind of best practice blueprints, as they're calling them now. And so uh, I know Nick, and I think we might try and get him on the show to talk about it more, about having a community set of here's a load of settings that you should have and comparing your, your own tenant to that. So maybe a bit like you've got secure score, you've got the um, mm -hmm. 
uh, what's the compliance score, uh, productivity score, that kind of thing. And, and part of those is it balances against similar organizations to you. You can look at similar things of comparing, you know, is the way you've got set up uh, or is a classic external sharing? Is it too open? Is it too locked down? Being able to have uh, compare that against the set would be great. And I, I think it's definitely worth if that is in something you're interested in speaking to Nick and uh, I think trying to get that community set of blueprints going and what that means. I, I think that could be hugely powerful um, to kind of answer that question uh, as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's standardization, right, of making mm. sure that if, you know, one organization has particular needs or requirements that that can then be applied to more organizations, then you're not starting from scratch. You're not going through every single configuration. You're working from a baseline that then you can adjust and tweak as as you go along. Um, and it's again, yeah, speeds that that process up. So, yeah, that that seems like it, it's a new thing that that's come along. And yeah, um, um, definitely, uh, I think we need we need to have a chat about that a bit more in depth, understand definitely. what that means a bit more. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly planning to look at that. But yeah, I love Microsoft 365 DSC, and uh, I, I think one of the things that has been a challenge sometimes is the documentation. And so uh, that that refresh looks really good. And and there's a YouTube channel as well. So it seems that the the kind of marketing and promotion side is uh, is is looking like it's getting some investments. Uh, as, as far as open source investment goes, anyway. Time. <laughs> yes. Community input, yeah. Yes, love. Yes, yes. love. Yeah. It's the cost of love. Um, so the final article we're going to talk about today was one of my ones, and it's kind of a, uh, you'll be unsurprising to hear from my side, it's talking about employee engagement and the, the, the Viva side of things. Uh, I was described, I noticed, by um, Pete Rising, uh, who's been doing his alphabet of Microsoft 365. In fact, we should probably uh, put that in the show notes in a minute. Um, uh, he got onto V and describes me as uh, Mr. Viva, which I was slightly embarrassed about uh, and don't think I deserve anything near that title. But uh, I do thank you for that, Pete. If uh, you throw anyway, Viva into every sentence that you have, then that's I do, what's going to happen, do. isn't it? <laughs> Viva obsessive, I would go with rather than Mr. Viva. I think that uh, does down many people, uh, especially when Microsoft do some great work in there. But uh, thank you, Pete, anyway. Um, the yeah the surprising impact of meeting free days and uh, it seems to be a quite a, a hot topic i know many organizations have been looking at putting these there's been talk about four day weeks and things like that and trying to look at that that culture of burnout and things that we've been going through and that the kind of productivity are we actually getting the productivity so uh mit i think I think it was did this uh, survey yeah part of the MIT Sloan management review did a survey of 76 country uh, companies one of a thousand employees each operations in many many countries and looked at people who'd introduced one to five no meeting days per week um, with there as well so some of them apparently prohibiting even one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, within there uh, that kind of idea of uh, no meetings five days a week never a meeting ever again is slightly daunting but slightly nice to think about that as well um that just, and what was that really that just sounds that sounds bizarre doesn't it i'm not allowed to collaborate in any way with my co-workers don't talk to organized them. structure <laughs> <laughs> but i mean I, I, before i go into these results and give them away i mean gary that's kind of what you do quite or, or have done for a while for cli where you have very few face-to-face -face meetings it's all done yeah. through chat and uh, online and things like that so it's it's not insurmountable but yeah I, I quite like to talk to people if I'm honest it's it's yeah you're right we we have a one hour bi-weekly meeting um, where we just kind of talk about high level topics about you know things that we may want to do but it's not the day-to-day -day, uh, kind of collaboration that we do around issues and pull requests that is all async it's all remote we're all in different time zones in fact it, it, we struggle to get together because we we have time zone uh, challenges as well um so it, it's seen as a more of a it, it's nice just to have a chat and actually see people uh, right rather than uh, typing but it's interesting because today i went and read the gitlab report from a while back we've talked about asynchronous communication yes. yeah. um and, and it's funny how we're talking about the no meeting days and then going oh there's no meetings whatsoever and yet you know i remember when that article came out and there's the report about going full asynchronous you know they'd done the remote part but actually it's the asynchronous part that came along to 
how that had an effect on mental health and, and, and burnout and productivity as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? It's like, yeah, no meetings, and it's like, oh, well, could it work? Could it not? Well, you know, there are some organisations out there that that again have those challenges, right? At time zones, sometimes it is just more beneficial not to have those meetings. Sometimes, absolutely. So. Well, it was interesting this study because they 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 looked at that kind of one one meeting free up to five meeting frees, and uh, for those who look on there, you can see it, autonomy increased. So with no meetings, you have more autonomy within there. Uh, the amount of communication. Uh, it interestingly increased. I, I think there are detail further on how they check that. But then you start to see things drift off. So co- cooperation, if you had five days per week, that actually tailed off near the end. And what they found was generally that that kind of three to four meeting days per week was was the most beneficial. So engagement from people, uh, if you had no meetings at all, dropped off to 27%. Sorry, go on, looking, that's, that's looking at the numbers, 27%, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, the bit here is how going from one day is 15% of cooperation and then going to two days is 43%. That is a that is a jump, right? So that, that's kind of saying to me is one day is not enough. If you go to two, yeah. it's really worthwhile. If you go three, four, you're starting to see less of that benefit, right? So so maybe the, the what we should be saying is we should have two days that's the that seems to be the sweet spot uh i think and 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 i know you might well, get down to this but i can't days, not I see that's where they got to yeah but i can't not see that number down in the bottom right hand corner which is for five meeting three days per week stress is minus 75 <laughs> <laughs> percent i'm looking at that and going i want to be there <laughs> but yeah uh, true but then look at satisfaction um, whereas it, it kind of increased 65% over yeah. three days, whereas over five, it was only down at 42. So uh, they weren't That's... stressed, but they weren't particularly happy either. So, well, so is that an increase in satisfaction? I, I think so, yes. So this is increased still based on having there's, meetings. They're still 42% more satisfied than if they have yep. five days of meetings. Yes. I could live yep. with that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Being forty two percent well, more satisfied. It, it'd be inter- I, I don't know if it says in here whether people are remote, because I think if I had no meetings, I'd go insane sitting here in my little box room, not talking to anyone at all. Well, so I think I think, I think, I think it, you need it? some. So if you're in the office, maybe it'd be a bit different. But and I think this is I think this is where you know when you look at this and you look at you know how cooperation communication. You know, you're still going to engage with people. You still need to have that level of engagement. And this will really depend on the type of the type of work that you're doing, the role that you have, the responsibilities that you have and the type of person you are as well. You know, as you say, most of us would go mad if we were just sat in our own little cell. You know, right. Excellent. I'm, I've got no people to engage with. I can work on my own. But, you know, who do I speak to? I think the one thing with the meeting uh, thing is, though, um, and, and this might be linked to the stress and maybe part of the asynchronous communication I was talking about before is with asynchronous communication, there's not that immediate need to respond yep. because yep. there is that natural lag. Whereas when you're in meetings and you get asked a direct question, and you have that, oh, I've literally got to think there and maybe respond mm-hmm. or feel like i need to be to, to respond straight away and that can obviously increase the the stress levels uh, a bit so it's interesting you know between between that with the meetings and uh, I guess, that, that need know, to respond it's this is all internal as well that we're talking about we're not talking about client facing or external meetings so you know it really does come down to you know if your internal customers are you know your internal staff are your customers how does that how does that play into it or is it amongst your team there's a lot of factors to take into account but i have to say 75 percent less stress 42 percent more satisfaction i'll keep yeah. with those numbers <laughs> <laughs> they're good numbers <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I i really like that article i think it's I, I do like it when someone comes up with some evidence to back up this kind of assumption that those meeting free days are worthwhile and uh, I know it gets ignored in this day of misinformation, but uh, always good to have some evidence for things. 
So, uh, yeah, three nice articles and related stuff there. Um, we're going to cover a bit of events coming up. Um, the first one, I think, sadly, most of you will probably miss by the time you've heard this. But uh, Gary and I are speaking tomorrow on the uh, uh, with the Microsoft Reactor. So it's not actually at the Reactor. It is all online um, within there. And we're talking about the second hour series on open source on Azure. And uh, if, you, if you haven't, you can go to the Reactor YouTube. In fact, I'll try and remember to put the link in the show notes uh, on that and listen to our What is Open Source? And you can hear my little story about uh, setting up your own library. Um, uh, shit, I, Gary's chuckling. I got a little bit overexcited about that one. It's fair to say there's animations and everything. Um, but this one, we're to, this one we're talking about tomorrow is how do you get involved in open source? And I think this this to me was the original point of the series was to to look at this about how you can get involved how you can use how you can make the most of it uh, and we'll be talking a, bit, a little about some of the terminology and things so it should be a good session tomorrow and um, i should I, I haven't got this up i might try and look for this and put it in the show notes but also modern workplace paris is happening at the moment so uh, they, they've had the um pre-conference days today and there's two days worth so do do sign up for that some great great events so many good speakers uh i'm speaking with anna inez ratio tomorrow um and so we uh, Wilson, I forgot her surname for a minute. That was embarrassing. Um, we, we're talking about Dynamics, HR and Microsoft Fever and how they're better together, which uh, should be good. And we, we'll have a little bit of announcement on that, one, which is fantastic. Um, and then speaking with Mr. Christopher Pond of CPS on Wednesday about uh, our journey, Microsoft Fever at CPS. So uh, check that one out. Um, there's another event. Um, it's got here rich to speak, but I'm pretty sure the call for speakers has closed for Collab Days Bletchley. But Wednesday, 23rd of Feb, um, it's a venture over at Bletch Bletchley Park, which is absolutely fantastic. It's got the National Museum of Computing there. So uh, lots of great speakers are going to be at that one. So if you are in the area, do, do sign up and give that a go. Unfortunately, it's half term, so I'm not going to be around for that one unless I can uh, swing something in the next few days. But uh, sadly, it looks like I won't be able to get along to that. Um, Gary, you've got an event coming up. Yeah, I guess it's a, a series. Uh, so uh, yeah, with my uh, colleagues in the DevOps dojo in the uh, community uh, within Microsoft, um, we are running a six part series on uh, YouTube um, through the uh, Microsoft Dev Radio. So if you're interested in GitHub, DevOps, Agile, all things development, developer velocity as well. So all that good stuff like code spaces and everything. Uh, six part series where we're going to go through absolutely everything. Um, so if you're thinking, you know, GitHub or Azure DevOps or, you know, which one do I go with? If you don't know much about GitHub and what it can offer, this will give you absolutely everything. Um, so, so, yeah. so Div Radio on YouTube. Isn't YouTube TV? <laughs> yes. Right, okay. Uh, I'm going yes. to gloss over that yeah. in the interest of time. I'm not in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's not going to get renamed. So I know it's a Microsoft event, but uh, anyway, I'll Possibly, move on yeah. quickly. <laughs> um, a quick one, Teams Nation is coming up in March. Has it got the link to the actual date? I don't think it has on here. I'm going to say oh, 23rd of March. There we go. 23rd of March, Teams Nation. Um, reason we mention it is the call for speakers is closing in the next few days. So 2nd of Feb is the call for speakers closure. Um, so get your ones in for there. As you, if you're looking on the screen, you can see I've already got my maximum number of submissions in there. Went to do it the weekend, panicking, thinking, oh, I must remember to do oh, that look, and realised I had. Some ideas, to, some ideas to steal. Fantastic. Obviously, even showing up there. <laughs> um, that is good and also consverse so the registrations opened up for consverse as well as the call for speakers for that one it was such a good event last week i think al you we really enjoyed that one didn't we absolutely yeah it's great and they've yep. got uh jason bradbury uh best known as host of tv's the gadget show um doing the keynotes so lot, lots of entertaining so in fact we can see ourselves on screen there uh just squeezing in next to uh jason's shoulder there um, looking suitably uh, impressed by everything, which is good. Unlike Tom here, looks like he's falling asleep. <laughs> That's a brilliant one. picture. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I think he was filming at that point, so I'm, I'm going to let him off. But uh, it's it's one of those things that now I can't unsee Tom. <laughs> it's just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to watch YouTube instead. Sorry, Tom, if you're listening. Um, 
I got a feeling I've missed a, an event somewhere. Oh, the, the you've got the Microsoft 365 for security. Uh, security compliance, compliance user group on Wednesday, 6 p.m. UK time. Not too late to register. At least whilst we're recording, it's not. So, uh, yeah. There we go. So we've got Luke. We've got- Luke Evans and Jose Pinos doing uh, Prepare for Battle, Kill Teams, Bad Actors, uh, using Sentinel, and Corinne Bassett, Essential Microsoft 365 Security Features. So should be uh, nice. should be a good session. They always are with that one. I, it's another one of those user groups that's on a Wednesday when I'm at Cubs, which I'm still sad about, but uh, always worth joining if you can. Um, the only other one I was going to call out is the Grey Hat Beard. So uh, if you would like to appear on the show, we now have a sessionized page because they've made some updates um, to it. And you can now uh, have it for user groups, which why it works well. So sessionized.com slash Grey Hat Beard. I'm going to be sending out to a few of you who might be listening, um, asking you to to come on. Um, if there's someone you know who you'd like to hear from, give them a shout. Get them to go to sessionized.com slash Grey Hat Beard. Uh, and we'd love to get you on the show. Um, otherwise, I think that's it. I didn't miss any other events or any things coming up. I know there's a lot of things. There's the M365 virtual marathon. I think the call for speakers is open for that um, and various other ones. So plenty of events coming up. I'll try and pick up a few more of those. But otherwise, we will wrap up there. Um, do listen out. Part two will be out next week. We'll be sharing our interview we did with the Microsoft Spotlight team, talking about women in tech uh, and uh, plenty of other topics around that. So uh, really interesting chat and really good to have them on there. Otherwise, I've been Gray. I've been the hat. I've been Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.